you know, they spoke to me. I, I saw, you know, this, this combination of, of the intelligence and the emotion, the, the, the emotional weight was, was obvious. Uh, and it just was something that, that, you know, I don't know how else to describe it. It's my pleasure. It's, it's great to be here. And uh, I certainly enjoyed our, our meeting in Brussels, you know, with uh, Kevin. And that was tons of fun. And, and oh, those uh, cocktails were delicious, weren't they? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Sitting up there on that mezzanine, looking at mm -hmm. oh, so much fun. Yeah, I know. I miss traveling. Oh, my gosh. I have been stuck in my two bed flat in central London for, what, 18 months? I'm going crazy. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I just, uh, you know, I was itching to go to Brunia, but I just, mm. you know, too soon, maybe parkours, yeah. but, uh, yeah. you know, it, uh, I miss the whole experience and, and uh, the people, and not to mention, of course, the art, you know, which is, Indeed, which is yeah. fantastic, yeah. just that, that combination of, of, of all that, and so. Indeed, we, indeed, we, absolutely. So you're gonna be in Paris in September, do you think? Hopefully. You know, I've got a lot of sculpture work that I'm trying to juggle and, mm. and uh, it, you know, just it, it depends on how things are looking in terms of the virus and all that. But it yeah. seems like it's shaping up to where things are under control. So, Indeed. So, uh, I've had my first job, second job right, in okay. July. So we're Good. getting closer to freedom. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. I think we should probably start with you introducing yourself. I mean, again, we can always okay. do that uh, at the end of the video. but. Just, sure. you know, who you are and where you are and what we're about to see. Okay. Well, um, I'm a sculptor. And about 30 years ago, uh, I started uh, collecting bifuebe, you know, plural of kifuebe. And the first one I saw just knocked me out from across the room. You know, I, you know, this otherworldly combination of these strange forms and and I'm sure it was a Kalebwe male mask that I saw but I don't remember specifically which one it was but uh, uh it just the stare of it was so intense and then when I started to dissect the details and and just the intelligence of the groove patterns and the location and the dialogue of the facial details that created this emotional expression, which just, you know, I mean, that's what art, art is all about, this intelligence and emotion in, in one object, you know, for me. And, and so, I, and it really related to the work I was doing at the time. So I just, I thought, this is great. I love it. And, but of course I followed my eye, which was uneducated. And I had a tremendous amount of fakes and it was a big learning experience and it was difficult and it was heartbreaking at times. Mark Felix would come over and go fake, fake, fake. <laughs> and then finally one time he said, real, but why would you want it? And <laughs> at least so you're I heading in the right as a, direction. <laughs> as I, I, you know, but, um, you know, but it was frustrating and I didn't get much support from the, the local, uh, art collecting crowd here in Southern California. It, it, Why, do you think those... that is? Why do you think that is? Is it because of the type of art you were collecting? Is it because there was so many fakes in the market that they just weren't interested in that particular type of mask? Why do you think that there was not that much excitement at that well, time? Well, because at the time, a lot of the veteran collectors, as I understood it, only believed a Kifuebe mask if it was documented to early European collections and, and had some early field data and all of that. And they dismissed everything else. And it took them years and years to catch up. Mm. So that was, it was good for me, but it's, it's not good anymore because everything is so expensive and, and, <laughs> and there's not much out there. And so, so. Right, that's because uh, you've got it all, Woods. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you'll see there, there, there's a, um, as we walk around, I'll point out different favorites of mine and, mm -hmm. and talk about, uh, you know, the, the Songi and Luba, the two different people who create these masks. And the Songi 
uh, well, I'll get into it more in detail when we are looking at specific masks. Uh, the Songhi make a male, which is malevolent, and a female, which is benevolent. And the Luba, both their males and females, are much more difficult to have to distinguish the, the genders, but they're basically all uh, benevolent except for the owl masks. Uh, and so, um, uh, but you know, it, it's been a long journey. And, uh, you know, as I said, sometimes frustrating. And, and but, but how, sometimes did you, how did you manage that though? How did you manage early on? Because this is what discourages a lot of collectors that are starting out. You know, most collectors make mistakes. You will have purchased a fake in your career, in your collecting journey. Um, and for someone to come into your home and say, fake, 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 how did that not discourage you? <laughs> you know, that oh, would turn it, so it, many people it, off. It, 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 was, it was discouraging, uh, but also I, I loved the material so much. Uh, I just really felt that uh, if I was gonna do this, I have to accept the fact that I'm gonna make mistakes and learn by those mistakes. Um, and that's what I did. But there was a couple of times when I thought, this is too frustrating. I'm not going to do this. You know, and we had a really good uh, collection of Central African and African in, in general and, and Oceanic and pre-Columbian. Uh, but this was what I just, I really wanted to go deep into this material. And uh, so I just kept at it, you know, and continued to make mistakes. But I got some good masks along the way. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the uh, uh, European dealers that I'd met at some of the tribal shows in San Francisco, and they used to have them in, in Los Angeles and Santa Monica as well. Uh, I sort of had this initial friendship and connection with them. And they would say, come to Bruniev. And so I started going to Bruniev and, and uh, that, was, that was incredible. The first time I was at Bruniev, I lost six pounds and uh, <laughs> just walking around, just, just walking around, yeah, just, gallery yeah, to just gallery. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so, um, uh, but it, it, you know, I, I kept going to museums and looking and and uh, uh, and and picking up different bits and pieces of information, uh, which I addressed in in some of your your questions uh, and knowing about the different styles and where they fit in in a timeline uh, was very helpful. And Mark Felix gave me some really great tips about things, about the so age it, of the world. I mean, the interesting thing with you, though, as a collector is it seems like you're quite academic with your approach as well. Like you really study the pieces. It, it goes beyond the aesthetic for you. It's I want to understand the lines. I want to understand the different eyes, the mouths. And, I, you know, I hope as we're going around, you can start to show us those differences. But it's I really can, interesting I, that your approach is academic. Well, yeah, I, I guess uh, I never thought about it that way. But it, it just was, uh, you know, as I get older, I've always been sort of an obsessive person. And as I get older, as you can see by 350 masks around here, you know, but uh, as I get older, it just got more intense. Mm. And I would, I would look at all these details, the, the chin skirts, the horizontal eye spines, all these different names that I came up with certain physical traits of these masks. But also as I learned uh, the function and the use, I began to look at the masks like, do these facial details, the eyes, the, the, the slant of the eyes, the, the relationship to the mouth and, you know, and the groove patterns, do they create an expression that goes hand in hand with the function of the mask? Mm. You know, the, I mean, all these things are very subjective, you know, of course, and, and but I loved it and I love kind of trying to um, dissect figure the meaning out. Of yeah, yeah. Yes. And, and, and I, I used to years ago, I don't do this anymore. Every night when I go upstairs to bed, I'd take a mask with me and lay it, lay it on the floor and I'd fall asleep looking at it, you know. My <laughs> wife would go, oh my God, what is it? He's really off the deep end now, you know. But, How did she but, feel about that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, uh, and, Initially, you know, she's sort of a minimalist, 
And, you know, she really responded to the pre-Columbian uh, the, the most. And so, as she said, as she says, I sort of left her in the dust when I got into this, but she fully supported it. And she said, if this is your passion, you know, you know, aside from our family and, and, and my work, she said, go for it, do it. We're in the living room. All right, well, the, you can see a selection of songy masks here. You know, the female songy masks, like here's a, here's a great example, are very benevolent. They're all about healing and uh, uh, protection and establishing a sense of um, harmony uh, in the village uh, as opposed to the uh, malevolent uh, evil uh, male masks. Uh, the male masks, like the one on the left here, uh, Eastern Songi male mask is primarily composed of wide red, black and white bands of color. Uh, and with 90% of the time, a raised two dimensional crest. Where the females are primarily white with uh, black and red details with no crest, that's with the Songi. And um, let me walk over, let me go over here. Um, that, you know, a lot of these have been published previously, like, like that one, mm -hmm. uh, which also was field collected by Carl Plasmans. Uh, and some have kind of a, a mix of Kalebwe and Eastern Songi uh, characteristics, like the eyes on this. Definitely Kalebwe. You know, when we go upstairs to the Kifwebe study gallery, you'll see a collection of Kalebwe masks. This is a um, funeral mask where uh, it was probably used uh, in conjunction with the death of a young, important young Songhee person. Uh, and a, an effigy was made and laid out on the ground with sticks and clay and cloth and this was the head. Here, here's a, a Songi female that has subjectively, as I describe it, the agony of wisdom. Uh, you know, I, I enjoy coming up with these, these almost contradictory uh, emotional uh, descriptions as I decipher these expressions. This mask right here, which I remember when I first acquired this from Didier Klaas, I, when I first saw it, I just thought, oh my God, I've got to have this. And it's a mask that I enjoy looking at constantly every day. And years ago, as I was looking at this, I noticed uh, what I refer to as a secondary groove pattern. Now, if you follow the change of direction, Mm -hmm. of the grooves on this, it creates another line. This shield, one of my favorite objects, also from uh, Didier. And uh, I, from a pre-1930s German collection. And I had seen it, uh, never in person, but in this uh, uh, little book he published, uh, I forget, in. The, 2006, maybe seven. And I always was nuts for it. And then it became available again and he had it. So I just, you know, I just went for it. These pieces, like the Kifwebe mask, deny the natural order of things. The idea of these stones, their identity is denied, gravity is denied. With the masks, the whole notion of this otherworldliness, the world that we know, this combination of, of spirit and human and animal, something out of our world. There's an intuitive thing that you learn when you look at hundreds 
if not thousands of these masks. You know, there's a, there's a feeling that for me is more important than reasoned intelligence. It's an emotional dissection of the material that you can see, you can, you can look, and you can, you can see that stare. You can see that that was believed in. You could see that that was powerful in a culture at some point. And that's something that I feel collectors who get, who certainly who go deep in a specific area, have this greater understanding of what they're looking at than some scholars. Uh, those are Luba animal masks. And uh, they were field collected by Mark Felix and published uh, uh, in several of his books. Uh, in general, the Kifuebe mask is a combination between animal, human, and spirit. Mm -hmm. But these Luba animal masks are obviously recognizable. Uh, you know, these, these two right here with the horns and that one. And those are three leopards up there. At one point, I was just thrilled, and I still am, with the idea of collecting all these various styles. You know, and sometimes I'll get a mask and I'll think, it's real, it's got some decent age, but it's not in great quality, but I don't have that. And then maybe five or six years later, I'll find one of much better quality. And so I'll get rid of the first one. My most recent acquisition, which is a rare little known style. I have another later example of, of this particular style, but um, I acquired that recently from Alan Naum. And, and uh, as soon as I saw it, I mean, I knew the mask. And mm -hmm. so I really wanted to get it. And this one, the lines, the bands are painted on. Most of the masks, you know, is defined by incised grooves and separated by the physicality of those grooves. And sometimes they're in, in kind of layers like this one right here. But there are a number of them. Here's another plasmids mask over there that's just pigment. And sometimes European enamel is applied directly over um, uh, natural pigment. Like this mask, which was on the cover of African Arts Magazine a number of years ago, uh, as concerns an article that Dunya Hersak wrote. And it was orange, the, the red color was orange, you can see in the mouth there. And so this overpainting, uh, has a, has a big history with these masks. Oh, and you can see on Luba masks, let me see if you can see there, you can see there are organic charges in the leading edge of that crest. And also underneath right here, I don't know if you can make it out or not, there are also organic charges. And, and so these were bits and pieces of perhaps uh, bark from a tree hit by lightning, ground up umbilical cord of twins. Uh, that comes from Dunya Hersak's uh, research uh, that, were, that were implanted in these masks to give them additional power. And the Luba masks, what, what I believe is they needed ancestral help for their functionality for their power to work.
I had this cabinet built and I put an installation up there, which again goes sort of hand in hand with the thinking of the denial of the natural order through continuity. And these Eastern female masks right here and, and, and this uh, shield, uh, if you analyze the groove patterns, you know, they have a very uh, strong feeling of continuity, a as do these works of mine. Here's my studio here. And up there is uh, my Kifuebe study gallery. What we're going to do is we're going to head through my office, and mm -hmm. then we're going to go up into the uh, Kifuebe study gallery. Uh, th these masks, the Kalebwe males, are, this is like many, many years of, of collecting and, uh, uh, and just, and, and this really is the, the type of object, the type of mask that speaks to me uh, the most. Um, but also it's probably the type of Kifuebe that is most often copied and made for the marketplace. Actually, this crazy mask, then you published it. And I remember when I saw it in her book, I thought, oh my God. It, it turns out, uh, I later found out it was Carl Plasman's favorite Kifuebe he ever collected. And I began to see other masks that have the same out. detailing, the eyeball. The central Kalebwe, you see the eye cavities are separated mm -hmm solid body of that white color. There oh, are no grooves on it. And with the Northern Calabria, the groove patterns are extended onto the eye cavity. This is another one of these masks where as soon as I saw it, I thought that is mine. <laughs> and Alan Nam had it a number of years ago. And the key Branley has, uh, has one by the same hand, uh, but this is so strong, so powerful. These are a, a group of Bifuebe, of which I have many more with full costumes that I acquired years ago from Patrick Kloss. These I believe were used in kind of a, a changing context, uh, a less traditional uh, than the older ones. But I understand it, their mission was to uh, explain the history of their culture and village to the villagers. I'm going to go back downstairs and finish the comments. I've been spoiled, I think, by <laughs> so many um, interactions with good dealers in Brussels and Paris. Uh, and now that the prices are so high, it's, it's difficult for me to buy with any consistency. Plus now I'm more interested in where do they go from here?